Uh, good morning, everyone. One second. Welcome to our Operator Certification Program Outreach event. We're going to be covering PFAS in Arizona today as we have it uh, updated with ADEQ. Just uh, uh, three of our drinking water talents are going to be presenting over the next three hours. Uh, just as a reminder, these are all, uh, all three hours are PDH, are earnable for PDHs, but we also would like you guys to take some um, information out of this as PFAS affects pretty much everyone in Arizona. So in session nine to 12. Just to go over some basic housekeeping rules. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, this session is available for PDHs. You'll be able to find the agendas and other handouts in the handout section on your toolbar here. The agenda PowerPoints, excuse me, I'm reading it pen row from Word. You already know that part, it's in the handout sections. All webcams are disabled and all attendees are muted. If you have any questions, please put it in the chat and we'll unmute you one by one. The, web car, the web, uh, webinar is being recorded. We'll have this uploaded to our, whoa. <laughs> of course it went back, excuse me. What happened? Yeah, well then there you go. You already know it's ahead. Uh, just to go over our housekeeping rules. The webinar is being recorded for people who can't attend today and they would like to earn additional PDHs that will be available on our ADQ YouTube page. And then if you have any follow-up questions after our presentation, you can reach us at the azopsert, azdq.gov email. You can call the program at 602-771-0100. Okay. Uh, just to go over the agenda for PFAS in Arizona, uh, as I mentioned, we'll be having three presentations from our drinking water leads on the PFAS topic, starting with Karen Shanfelt, followed up by David Burchard. We'll be taking a break from 10.50 uh, to 11 a.m. And then we'll close out with Yasmina Markovic as our final presentation. At this time, once again, please hold all questions until after each present, uh, presenter's presentation. Uh, we'll unmute you one by one. And with that, I'll pass it onwards to Karen. Karen, are you ready? I am. Are you able to see my presentation, Ebony? I am, thank you. Please continue. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome you all to our PFAS webinar. It uh, looks like we have a great turnout. Uh, looks like a, over 140 participants. So we're very excited to have you joining us this morning. My name is Karen Shanafelt. I am a drinking water unit manager here at ADQ. I currently manage our inspections, compliance, and enforcement unit, and also our source water protection unit. I have been with ADQ for over five and a half years. Um, and also at ADQ, I previously managed our engineering review unit technical and technical assistance. So done a couple different aspects here in the drinking water value stream. Prior to my time at ADQ, I was in private industry for quite a few years working at a full service environmental company. So I have had private sector and public sector um, experience. Today, I'd like to talk to you about EPA's PFAS strategic roadmap. And some of you may not even be aware that EPA did release this roadmap um, a year ago. And it's exactly a year ago today, October 18th on 2021. The EPA Administrator, Michael Regan, um, announced EPA's agency um, roadmap, laying out the whole agency approach to handling PFAS. And the roadmap identifies timelines and specific actions that 
they intend to safeguard human health in for, from PFAS. My particular presentation, the agenda, I'll give you a brief introduction to the strategic roadmap. We'll talk about EPA's agency approach. And when I do use the term agency, I am referring to EPA. Um, ADQ is in alignment with EPA's approach, but this is definitely a document created by EPA. The roadmap identifies specific goals and objectives and some of those key actions. And we'll follow up with conclusions, and then there'll obviously be an opportunity for us to have questions. Here is a screenshot of what the um, document looks like. Like I said, it was released a year ago today. Um, to give you a little bit of background, I think this is relevant. The EPA Administrator, Michael Regan, he came from the North Carolina DEQ, and he saw firsthand what kind of devastation PFAS can actually result in. There is a town in North Carolina called Fayetteville where Kimors is a manufacturing company that had been manufacturing Gen X. It's a PFAS compound. And they started manufacturing that back in 2009. After seeing the devastating effects that the community was dealing with, with cancer incidences, birth defects, um, immune system response um, deficiencies. Uh, North Carolina DEQ did an investigation with their Department of Health and worked with Comores on their discharging of uh, Gen X. And um, Gen X is a PFOA replacement. So like I said, he had seen firsthand what, what kind of devastation it was resulting in and you know, just to keep in mind that it's particularly challenging to hold these manufacturers accountable, particularly when Gen X isn't yet regulated. So um, I'm, he's hoping to carry over some of those initiatives into the strategic roadmap as well. If you're looking for a copy of this document, you can simply uh, just Google EPA PFAS strategic roadmap, but my presentation also has a link in the notes section. So I'm assuming that my audience today, hopefully we're having um, public water system managers and owners, as well as certified operators on the line. And so PFAS hopefully is not anything new to you. You've heard about it, it's been in the media, but it is relevant for me to talk a little bit about it because as we become more aware of PFAS in drinking water systems, it will be public water system responsibilities to communicate that to their customers. So there are many people that have never heard of the term, are not aware of the family of PFAS compounds, don't understand the chemistry behind it. And as a public water system, communicating PFAS in your water is so essential and being able to bring it down to a level where people can understand. Um, and so I do wanna talk about, you know, some of the key aspects that PFAS, are not new. They've been in our lives, you know, our entire lives. They've been in, in commerce for the last 80 years. They're used in a whole host of consumer products. Obviously, a firefighting foam is one that gets a lot of media, but it's also um, found in paints and varnishes, waterproof clothing, um, any kind of outdoor equipment that has a waterproof component, shampoo, sunscreens, cookware, pesticides, herbicides, and even food wrappers and pop, you know, microwave popcorn bags. So you'll find any kind of PFAS compound in any of these products. They are a synthetic group of chemicals, which means they are man-made, or you may have heard the term anthropogenic. Um, and I wanna take a moment here to compare PFAS to other, another, another contaminant that we have um, in Arizona. So the prevalent contaminant that we deal with in our drinking water section in Arizona is arsenic. And arsenic is a naturally occurring contaminant. There is no plume, there is no responsible party. Um, we have quite a few systems that currently treat for it. Unfortunately, we do have some systems that are exceeding the maximum contaminant level, and we're working with them to try to remedy that situation. However, on the other side, we have PFAS, which are man-made. 
there is a spill or um, a plume, so to speak. And very often, customers want to know who's responsible, who's going to pay, you know, where will that funding come from? So as you're developing your communication plan, those are some key things to keep in mind that typically if it's a naturally occurring contaminant, it seems to be a bit more palatable to the average consumer as opposed to these man-made chemicals. Um, another term that you've likely heard is that these chemicals are very persistent and are referred to as forever chemicals. Um, but what makes them a little, little bit more complicated is that they do degrade. They degrade from the longer chain um, carbon chain compounds to shorter chains, um, but they don't entirely degrade. So, but they do change over time, which makes it also a bit complicated to deal with. This timeline um, I did borrow from I, ITRC. I think it's a very um, telling timeline. It, it's, it's impactful, at least to me it is. As I mentioned, PFAS had been in development since the 1940s. The second bar, the yellow bar there, you see that it's been in um, manufacturing and production since that time to current day. The gray bar identifies when certain manufacturers started phasing out or using alternatives in the early 2000s. And then the green bar is when we've started developing different detection and analytical methods to actually test for PFAS compounds. But for me, the orange bar is what's concerning. Um, as you can see, we were or manufacturers or industry was aware of potential health concerns as early as the 1970s. So people that worked in manufacturing um, of PFAS compounds were starting to see some of these health concerns that, that we're hearing about nowadays, but there had been decades of inaction. And, I, and that's part of the EPA administrator's push is there have been decades of inaction. And his hope is that with the strategic roadmap that we can finally start to get on a path to control these compounds. This slide is a bit complicated, at least for me it is, but I wanted to display this because it's very essential to understand that when we're dealing with PFAS, I think the latest number is there are over 6,500 different PFAS chemicals and in an attempt to regulate and control them, there we've been trying to categorize them. So, categorize them to categorize them helps us to better potentially regulate them in groups as opposed to individually. As you can see, we the categories are first divided into polymers and non-polymers, perfluorinated, polyfluorinated, and then it breaks down even further. And EPA has even um, used computer software that helps to systematically categorize some of these over 6,000 PFAS chemicals to put them into categories that, you know, they may have similar structure or similar chemical um, properties and things of that nature, uh, which is very key as we move forward with regulation. The other aspect I want to be clear about is that PFOA and PFAS are no longer technically manufactured in the United States. However, they are still being produced internationally, um, typically in Asia or Eastern Europe. And those products are still currently being imported into the United States. And we'll find them in things like carpets and leather goods, textiles, paper packaging. So PFAS is, is not considered a legacy contaminant. It is still very much currently in our um, in consumer goods. Let me back up to one slide also, or two slides here, to comment about firefighting foams. So um, the Air Force and the DOD have been very working very aggressively to find potentially PFAS-free firefighting foams. But um, the firefighting foams do need to meet DOD strict restrictions. And so there have been different formulations over the years where they're trying to phase out PFO and PFAS, but there are still other PFAS components in firefighting foams. But um, I know Air Force has been stating that when they are using firefighting foams, that contain any kind of PFAS chemicals, they are trying to contain it, um, to, to gather it and 
potentially prevent the release into the environment. So the point I'm trying to make is when you see a product that says PFOA free, it may not have PFOA, but it may have other PFAS compounds. So you have to be savvy in understanding that there are alternate PFAS compounds out there that very much are still in use. So getting back to the um, strategic roadmap, uh, the EPA agency's approach is they're looking at the entire life cycle of PFAS. It's really the only way to truly address all of the different areas that we're being exposed to PFAS. They definitely want to get upstream of the problem, which means understanding where the feedstock is coming from, who's manufacturing it, and, and trying to control that aspect of it. They want to hold polluters accountable. And even that term is a little, a little gray. Who do you consider to be the polluter? Is it those that manufacture the PFAS compounds? Those that incorporate it into their own products? Is it those that use firefighting foams or, or even the consumers themselves? So we'll talk a little bit more about that. EPA has also um, ensured that any decisions that they make moving forward about regulating PFO and PFAS are based on science. They're looking at the toxicology, they're looking at the science to ensure that, that's, um, that it makes good sense. The, the difference between the health advisory science and the MCL, once an MCL is established, is that a maximum contaminant level will take the science into account, but will also take the economics into account. And we'll touch upon that a little bit later on as well. And the, the PFAS strategic roadmap has a very strong initiative to be protective of disadvantaged communities as well. So you may have heard the, the term EJ or environmental justice, and that is a, definitely a recurring theme throughout the, the roadmap that we'll be discussing. So you may are, you know, you may be familiar with EPA's three R's and, you know, typically that's reduce, reuse and recycle, but now we kind of have three new R's, research, restrict and remediate. And what EPA is hoping to do, and they have been doing this for years, is investing in the research and development and not just in the toxicology and the exposure, but also understanding best available science when it comes to treatment technologies. And I know Yasmina will be talking about that a little bit later on as well. They have an um, initiative to restrict, again, preventing PFAS not only from entering water, but also air and land and taking up more holistic approach to being able to restrict um, PFAS. And then finally, remediate. They wanna be able to accelerate the cleanup of PFAS contamination to be protective of human health and the environment and not to, you know, the environmental litigation that took place in the 80s in regards to Superfund sites. They're trying to learn lessons learned from, from those those contamination um, from those Superfund sites and they're wanting to accelerate the cleanup and not just simply be stuck in litigation and into determining who's the responsible party. So first research, the first R, they're looking at the different categories of PFAS. They're trying to, again, categorize those over 6,000 different categories. They are looking at ways of how it's affecting different exposure pathways. Um, they determined or some of the methodologies they're using in assessing the human health impacts are, you know, taking a look at people are exposed to PFAS through drinking water, but also potentially in the air, through consumer packaging and things of that nature. So taking into account um, the different ways that we're being exposed to PFAS. They're also looking at understanding what is the proper way of disposing of PFAS. You know, we're, we typically think of landfilling or incinerating, but PFAS are particularly resistant to high temperatures and low temperatures and make, they make, they, it makes for them, the, the complete degradation is, is very uh, complicated at that point. It, you need to be able to attain very high temperatures to have complete destruction of PFAS chemicals. 
And then again, the focus on environmental justice. And even in Arizona, we have seen communities, unfortunately, that have been um, unduly burdened with environmental pollutants. So systems that have been near wharf sites or wharf are state-run Superfund sites are now also being impacted by PFAS. So, you know, unfortunately there are communities that are having to, to deal with multiple contaminants. And that is definitely a, a major focus of um, this PFAS strategic roadmap. The second R is restrict and EPA intends to use their statutory authority to completely restrict um, PFAS on multiple fronts. They're looking to work collaboratively within the different offices of EPA to, to regulate it on multiple uh, fronts and also to work cross agencies, to work with the Food and Drug Administration, to work with um, Department of Health in that, for instance, Food and Drug Administration, we're not currently aware of whether PFAS is currently found in bottled water and you know is that a safe alternative when you when you are aware of PFAS in your water so being able to work like I said their statutory authority even cross agency they want to take a look at the manufacturers and EPA has been able to identify about six or eight facilities that do produce PFAS feedstock and um, they've been able to kind of narrow narrow that industry and have a complete understanding. And you know, you may be familiar with some of those manufacturers, 3M, DuPont, Camores, um, Arkema, and they all manufacture potentially different PFAS compounds, may not be specifically P4, PFAS, but may be involved in the generation of Gen X or PFBS or other PFAS compounds. So just keeping that in mind that there is a fairly narrow um, section of industry that creates this type of feedstock. EPA also wants to establish voluntary programs, which they have done in the past in regards to asking industry to phase out certain chemicals, PFOA being one where um, uh, Kimors has and DuPont have successfully been able to voluntarily phase out the use of those compounds. But again, I point out that you have to be very careful in the wording that even though they've phased out PFOA and PFAS, they may still be using other PFAS compounds, which we don't yet clearly understand the full toxicity of all those other alternatives. And again, um, minimizing the PFAS discharges to all communities um, that are potentially impacted. The last R is to remediate, and again, using their statutory authority to um, help harmonize the actions between different agencies to ensure that we don't have um, lobbyist groups that are pushing their agenda, but rather continually focusing on health and the environment in regards to PFAS contamination. EPA is looking at the responsible party performance and funding, trying to hold everyone accountable, not just those that manufacture it, but those that are importing goods that may potentially include PFAS compounds. Um, that no one party is responsible, um, but yet we all need to come collectively together to try to address PFAS contamination. EPA is making an effort to provide resources and assistance, and we'll talk briefly about some of the financial assistance that will be available, but helping um, public water systems develop resources, like I said earlier, to be able to communicate what PFAS is and not to have people um, become al alarmed about PFAS, but rather to have a clearer understanding that these health advisory levels are exposure over a lifetime and to have a clear understanding of costs of treatment and things of that nature. And again, um, ensuring that treatment is being accelerated for those systems that have no other um, mechanism to prevent PFAS contamination. So moving on now to the key actions of the PFAS strategic roadmap, and these are specifically for drinking water. 
EPA has had the um, key action of undertaking nationwide monitoring for PFAS in drinking water. And this indeed is moving forward. This is what we're referring to as UCMR5, or UCMR stands for the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule. And it will be monitoring for 29 PFAS compounds and also lithium. It kind of got tacked on there. <laughs> That's the 30th um, constituent being analyzed for. And UCMR5 will enable us to collect uh, data from larger systems to see the prevalence of PFAS in our drinking water. It does include public water systems that serve a population of 3,300 or more um, consumers. And that's fantastic. That level had actually been lowered from the previous UCMR, and David will be talking a little bit more about UCMR. It used the cutoff used to be 10,000, and now they've lowered it to 3,300. However, in Arizona, um, we only have 155 public water systems that are required to participate in UCMR5, which is only about 10% of our public water systems. Because the majority of public water systems in Arizona do serve less than 3,300. Um, we have quite a few systems that serve less than 500. And so it becomes particularly challenging for these small systems from a financial um, standpoint to address PFAS contamination. What we're hoping to do as an agency is uh, to sample those systems that are below the 3,300 population threshold to do PFAS sampling at EPDSs. Now, ADQ has been involved in PFAS sampling since 2018. Much of that sampling had been focused on areas where we suspected there might be sources of PFAS, um, such as airports or Air Force bases, landfills, things of that nature. We kind of tried to prioritize those sites where we might see it. However, now our sampling efforts will be focused on those systems that are less than the 3,300 to identify which systems will potentially be regulated once, um, once PFO and PFAS have maximum contaminant levels. That takes me to my second key action um, that EPA does plan on regulating two PFAS compounds, particularly PFOA and PFAS. Uh, they are anticipated to release the proposed rule sometime in the fall. So any, any day now, we're hoping to have an understanding of what they're proposing as a maximum contaminant level. Um, once the draft is proposed, the final rule which should follow in the fall of 2023. Um, where, you know, there are definitely have been some concerns because the health advisory levels have been so low. Nobody really knows what the maximum contaminant levels will be, but definitely uh, will be much lower than what we had first anticipated um, in previous years when the health advisory levels were, were higher. The next um, key action is they plan on publishing final toxicity assessments for Gen X and five additional PFAS compounds. And these five additional compounds are relevant because as I mentioned earlier, they represent five different groupings or classes that many of the PFAS compounds could potentially be categorized under. And again, that's EPA's approach to trying to be able to handle over 6,500 different PFAS compounds is to understand them in, in groupings like that. The final toxicity assessments have not been released, but they did release draft assessments. And the way that EPA handles that is they use a system called IRIS or Integrated Risk Information System. Um, it's a program operated by EPA that helps them to come to these toxicity assessments. And you can definitely um, research that a bit more if you're looking about how, how those toxicity assessments are, are developed. The fourth key point here under the key actions are publish health advisories for Gen X and PFBS. And Gen X, as I've mentioned earlier, is the alternative for PFOA and PFBS is the alternative for PF, uh, PFOS, PFOS. And so 
Um, they had anticipated releasing those health advisory levels in the spring. Um, they were actually released in the summer, in June. And here, here are the, what we were calling the new health advisory levels. So prior to this summer, the, health, the old health advisory level for PFO and PFOS was a combined level of 70 parts per trillion. And so now the new health advisory levels have separated PFO and PFOS. They have their own interim health advisory level with PFOA being at 0 0.004 part per trillion, PFOS being at 0 0.02 part per trillion. Very, very low. These are very, very low levels. Um, perhaps you've heard comparisons of you know, a part per trillion being a drop in an Olympic-sized pool. Um, but yes, part per trillion is very low. And the other major concern as you can see from this chart, is that the minimum reporting level doesn't even get down to those health advisory levels, which EPA is well aware of that. They are continuing to research different analytical methods that will enable us to test down to those levels. But that is based on the science that they've they've come to um, have come to those health advisory levels. GenX and PFBS have also been issued final health advisory levels, and GenX is at 10 part per trillion, and PFBS is at 2,000. And again, um, higher than PFO and PFOS, but still very low. The one distinguishing aspect between these health advisory levels as well is that, oops, that the health advisory levels in general are they provide information on contaminants that can cause health effects in drinking water. They're meant to be um, somewhat conservative uh, in regards to taking into account other, other ways of being exposed to PFAS. They take into account a lifetime exposure, also taking into account sensitive populations, including those with um, compromised immune systems or um, children things of that nature. Um, currently, EPA has health advisory levels for approximately 200 or so different drinking water contaminants. Many of those may never be regulated, but serve as guidance for a public water system that may be impacted by um, one of these contaminants. But the interim health advisory levels for PFOA and PFAS were actually based on human studies, um, human populations that had been exposed to these chemicals. They have found that there had been um, immune response effects that they've seen, cardiovascular system effects, such as increased cholesterol levels. PFOA and PFAS can affect human development, um, decreased birth weights, and potentially are also carcinogenic. The final health advisory levels for GenX and PFBS were actually based on animal studies from oral exposures. So a bit of a different methodology involved there. And again, some of the similar health effects had been seen, um, more targeting towards liver and kidney effects, again, immune system. But one of the more alarming um, aspects when they were looking at the human studies for PFO and PFAS is that there is potentially a um, suppression of vaccine response. So people that have been exposed to PFO and PFAS, their bodies may not be producing antibodies once they receive a vaccination. So for instance, it was particularly tested on tetanus and diphtheria vaccinations. So when you receive a vaccination, your body is developing the antibodies to fight that. And if you've been exposed to PFO and PFOS, you may not be producing those antibodies as you should be to, to protect yourself. So the question there obviously is, well, how is this impacting me and my COVID vaccination? Um, we don't have enough science to, to, to definitively uh, conclude that there is a, a connection there, but definitely something to keep your eyes and ears open about um, in the future. So obviously we've been focusing very much on drinking water, but I also wanted to touch upon the other areas that the PFAS strategic roadmap is, is addressing. And so our um, sister value streams here at AGQ are also working on 
PFAS. So for instance, EPA is hoping to have PFAS discharge effluent limitation guidelines. So that again, it's addressing that whole life cycle of PFAS. They're looking to leverage national pollutant discharge elimination system permits or NIPTES permits to reduce PFAS discharges to waterways. Um, they are also looking for improved analytical methods. So David will talk a little bit more about this, but analytical methods that you may be familiar with are EPA method 537.1, which is for drinking water, and also method 533. But those methods may not be applicable to wastewater or biosolids or other um, matrices. And so they're looking, EPA is looking to improve those different analytical methods and also to be able to analyze for a larger scope of PFAS compounds. Right now, we're just looking at 29 PFAS compounds that are able to be analyzed. Um, the fourth item there, they're looking at ambient water quality criteria. So surface water, uh, you know, we're looking to ensure that we're protective not only of um, groundwater, but surface water as well, looking at PFAS and fish tissue and also biosolids. So as wastewater treatment facilities generate biosolids and being um, applied to land, looking to see how we can address PFAS through its entire life cycle. The strategic roadmap also has key action items. I'm not going to get into the specifics, but I do want to point out that um, other offices under EPA, for instance, the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, this is their primary mission is to protect um, you and the environment from potential risks of pesticides and toxic chemicals. They currently regulate the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. They regulate the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. They regulate TSCA and Pollution Prevention Act. So as we mentioned earlier, we're seeing PFAS in consumer products. And so this office is looking to regulate and control PFAS under those uh, environmental laws that they currently manage. The Office of Land and Emergency Management, their primary mission is emergency response and waste programs. So they handle Superfund sites and underground storage tanks and waste programs. So looking for when there is an emergency response or emergency spill, is that being contained and what kind of regulatory authority can be leveraged to help contain PFAS. Um, the Office of Air and Radiation, their primary um, mission is to con control air pollution and radiation exposure, managing the Clean Air Act and the Atomic Energy Act. And again, as we see in you know, manufacturers that are developing PFAS feedstock, they're potentially releasing PFAS into the air, or even carpets have been, have been analyzed knowing that there are potentially PFAS compounds that are being released from carpets and other consumer goods, and this is a focus of the Office of Air and Radiation. The Office of Research and Development um, is a scientific research arm of EPA, and it is a leading edge research agency that helps inform EPA about decisions of emerging concern, obviously such as PFAS, and we've been lucky enough to be able to send a couple of folks from ADAQ to ORD events to get a better handle on understanding the fate and transport of PFAS compounds. And um, as we mentioned, the research is one of the key three R's that EPA is focused on in order to address PFAS compounds. In conclusion, um, the PFAS Strategic roadmap is an aggressive, has an aggressive timeline in order to address PFAS. And obviously it's, it has to do with the current administration. We're unsure of what will happen in 2024 or whether the next administration would have the same um, objectives in regards to PFAS. And so wanting to be able to work quickly and diligently to get some of these regulations in place. There is a whole of agency approach, as we mentioned, not just drinking water, but all of the offices under EPA um, addressing PFAS and being able to truly leverage 
their statutory um, authority. And, you know, with the, with the ultimate goal, the ultimate mission is to be protective of human health and the environment. And as I've mentioned, ADQ does align themselves with this PFAS strategic roadmap. We have, have as an agency been able to monitor and address each of the key action items that have been released and we're aligning ourselves appropriately. We are trying to stay ahead of the curve and I would um, also encourage public water systems, do not wait until PFAS becomes regulated. We wanna make sure that people are being very proactive. So, you know, recommended actions, as I mentioned, we will be doing a comprehensive PFAS sampling this coming fiscal year for those systems that fall under the 3300. If your public water system does find that they have PFAS in their water, you, you, you really do need to continue to assess, which means you cannot make any decision based on one sample. Um, you really need to continue to sample and monitor, have an understanding of the levels of PFAS, you know, understanding which wells or which surface water intakes are being impacted, um, assessing the situation. It's not a time to be alarmist about PFAS, but to truly understand where it's, you know, potentially where it's coming from and how you can address it. But the key, the key step here is as a public water system, it's essential for you to inform your customers. And it is not regulatorily required yet to do so, but you need to think about how you're gonna develop that communication plan. Your customers, your consumers want to know. Um, and we are developing a PFAS toolkit, which will be uh, hopefully available before the end of the year that will give you key aspects of how you can assist your consumers that are concerned you know, perhaps helping them identify point of use devices or other um, alternate water sources that they may be able to, to um, consume. But information is key and whether that means, you know, using your social media avenues to inform your customers or your website or your consumer confidence report, um, don't inform them just because you have to, do it proactively. Um, it is a, a very strong recommendation from EPA and AD obviously um, supports that as well. And then steps to limit exposure, thinking about how you can potentially as a public water system limit your PFAS exposure. And I know we'll be talking about that a little bit later on as well. And the re another reason that I highly encourage you to be proactive is that funding is becoming available. EPA is making $1 billion in grant funding available through the bipartisan infrastructure law. That is the first of 5 billion that will be released. So there'll be $1 billion of grant funding released over the next five years. Yes, it is definitely geared towards small and disadvantaged communities but um, there is a website here that also identifies um, other funding sources. So EPA will be um, providing additional information on how, how public water systems can submit their letter of intent if you plan to participate in the grant program. So definitely you want to be aware of your PFAS levels so that you can take advantage of funding as it becomes available. And um, EPA also is uh, complements the, the bill uh, funding with additional state revolving um, funding or SRF funding. There is 3.4 billion in funding going through drinking water SRF funding. There's also 3.2 billion in the Clean Water Act um, SRF funds. So keep yourself um, abreast of the different funding sources that are available. Some of it is grants, some of it will be low interest loans. Um, EPA has not released too much additional information, but make sure that you're aware of what's out there and what you, what you are um, entitled to. And that also reiterates why we're pursuing the, the additional PFAS sampling at all public water systems to complement UCMR so that we can help prioritize sites. And we are, prioritizing community water systems and then non-transient non-community water systems and then transient 
non-community systems. We don't suspect at this point that transient systems will be regulated under the MCLs for PFO and PFAS, but at this point, we don't know for sure. We don't know whether EPA plans on regulating it for all systems. So um, hopefully we'll find out more later this year, but we definitely wanna make sure we have an understanding of the systems that are being impacted to date. I believe we're aware of 56 systems in Arizona that have been impacted by different levels of the different PFOA, PFAS, Gen X, and PFBS. I believe we have not seen any systems that actually have levels of Gen X, which is great, um, but we definitely uh, do have varying levels of, of contamination in, in systems. And I'm certain we'll find more as we continue to um, sample additional systems. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that folks have. Thank you, Karen, for that presentation. No problem. It looks like Ryan Hill uh, has submitted a question. Uh, why is the generator not the potential responsible party for PFAS? So EPA wants to take that holistic approach. So those that are generating the feedstock are a, a, a responsible party, but they're also saying that it's not, not just necessarily those manufacturers, but also the, the intermediate producers that are using the PFAS in their, in their compounds um, or potentially the users of it. So they, they really don't wanna just focus on the manufacturers, but the entire the entire chain of those using it. And, and it does become complicated. I know there's litigation going on for PFAS contamination down in the Tucson area. Um, but yes, a lot has been focused on the manufacturers. Um, but in order to address the problem, we need to look at it holistically. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Travis has a question here. To stay ahead of things, can a facility sample the PFAS themselves and provide ADEQ with the results? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Yes, um, we have been working collaboratively with many systems that are doing their own PFAS sampling. Whether you're a part of UCMR5 or not, or just are curious, yes, we encourage systems to go ahead and sample. Now, PFAS sampling is expensive. It's much more expensive than your traditional drinking water contaminants. Um, and that is why we're trying to get to each of those small systems. But by all means, yes, please proactively go and sample. And if you do get a hit, we do ask that, that please share that information with ATQ. We are developing a interactive map that will be external facing that will allow consumers to click on their public water system and see what the levels are. Again, the communication and that information is very key. So yes, we would definitely encourage systems to share that information with us whenever possible. Okay, thank you. Actually, to a follow-up of what you're just saying, Justine just asked a question. Um, her understanding is that PFAS sampling techniques are very stringent. Where and how can operators receive training to properly sample? That's a great question. And I'm gonna hold off a little bit on that because I know that David will be talking about sampling and yes, you are absolutely correct. Um, there is a, a, a risk for cross-contamination. So he'll touch upon some of those key aspects um, and hopefully he'll be able to provide you some guidance there. So I'll, I'll kind of defer that to David in the next presentation. Okay, uh, Andres just wanted to mention, excellent presentation. Travis? Thank you. and and. You know, I know a lot of that information is probably repetitive for a good portion of our audience, but again, it's good to reiterate and think about ways of being able to communicate it to your consumers um, moving forward as well. Travis has uh, one more question. Can mm -hmm. a facility sample their system using EPA method 537.1 instead of 533 and provide those results to ADQ? Yes, um, we have historically been using 537.1. Um, we are gonna, going to be moving to method 533 because it does encompass a, a larger scope of PFAS compounds, but both methods are EPA approved. Um, and so both of them are, both methods are valid. Um, and yes, yeah, so either method works for you, just have a clear, and again, David will uh, talk about those a little bit, um, just have a clear understanding of what you'll 
what results you'll get from each method because they they definitely cover different PFAS compounds. There's definitely an overlap, but some you know, but one of them definitely has more PFAS compounds that you'll get results for. Okay, thank you. And um, I've got three more questions for you. Uh, Lee asks, uh, how is ADQ dealing with the disconnect between EPM, EPA's interim and final health advisories for PFAS compounds and current PFAS detection levels? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? How is ADQ handling it? Or The disconnect between EPA's interim and final health advisories for our PFAS compounds and detection levels. So when the PFOA and PFAS interim health advisories were released, ADQ did reach out to systems where we knew there was PFAS contamination and made sure that they were aware of those lower levels. And again, strong recommendation of letting your customers know, whether that's through consumer confidence reports or social media venues. Um, the interim health advisories, once the, the maximum, once the MCLs are released, that will supersede the interim health advisory levels. Um, so that's how that's defined. So like I said, those draft MCLs should be released this year, and then that will supersede those interim health advisory levels. But the way that we're handling that um, is, again, just communication, letting people know, starting to have a, you know, public water system should start to have a plan in place to address it. Okay. It uh, looks like uh, from Mark, uh, how is PFAS destroyed? Um, once it's removed from the water, it's not destroyed, it's just removed from one location to another. What do we do with the contaminated medium? Yeah. And that's a great question as well. And I know Yasmina will be discussing that a little bit, but yes, they're, they're um, as I mentioned, PFAS are very resistant to high temperatures. So, you know, there has been talk about having to destroy it in RICRA um, incinerators that achieve higher temperatures. There's hydrolysis where you're actually breaking apart the bonds that will cause that compound to break down. But yes, I know Yasmina will touch upon that. It is very complicated. It is not an easy way to destroy it. And definitely something that EPA is looking at through that whole life cycle. But Yasmina will talk about that as well. Okay, I think we have time for this. One more question. Um, okay. Where can a small community get funding to pay for PFAS testing? So if you are a system that has been identified as participating in UCMR five and you're between 3,300 and 10,000, it's my understanding that EPA will assist you in the cost of UCMR sampling. If your system is less than the 3,300, uh, ADQ will be sampling for you and that cost will be on us. Um, but there are, there are, like I said, there are also grants available, the one billion in um, the bipartisan infrastructure law that is there to be used for sampling and also for potential treatment options. So as more, informa more information becomes available, we'll definitely let our public water systems know as well. But, and, mm -hmm. and you know, the, the advantage of having ADQ do the sampling for these small systems is that, you know, we've been able to, negotiate pricing with the labs to get that, to leverage that, that those prices. Cause like I said, PFAS sampling is definitely not cheap, um, and, but we definitely want those small systems to be, you know, have the, the sampling done so that they're aware. All right, thank you, Karen. And that concludes all of our questions. Um, we are at time for the presentation. So if you have any follow-up questions, please email Karen. Um, at uh, the email that I have just sent to everyone in the questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and move to our next presentation. Let's see here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right.
We need to move on to USMR5 and PFAS sampling in Arizona, presented by David Burchard. Let's see. One second, David. David, are you able to unmute yourself? David, I think you're still muted. Oh. All right. One second while we figure out how to get David unmuted. Yeah, so we're waiting for David one second on his uh, on our end for his mic. Let's go ahead and push back a little bit here. So we're going to go ahead and do a quick little mini presentation. Uh, just as a reminder, everyone here is earning PDHs while you're learning, and everyone's going to need, well, certified operators are going to need to upload these PDHs to your operator certification portal. On this end, let's go ahead and start on that. Uh -huh. So, I get a lot of questions, uh, this is a side note from the PFAS, about the uh, Operator Certification Portal. Uh, apologies, earlier I did not introduce myself. My name is Ebony Rohn. I am the Operator Certification Coordinator for the program. And I'm just going to be doing a small portal reminder for many of you who are going to have to access it later. Navigating the portal, uh, once you go to our Operator Certification, page, you'll see to the right the Operator Certification Portal. You all have four choices. I've just passed my test. You are brand new to ADEQ, never been certified, seeking to transfer your certifications from out of state to Arizona. Jurisdictions as well count. Those jurisdictions could be military or tribal. You may be applying to test early. You're an aspiring operator. Uh, you believe you can qualify for a grade two and up. Also, never been certified with ADEQ or you're also a seasoned veteran operator. You're, you've been with us, you have your certifications, you've been keeping them maintained. This is where you'll go and also to apply for reciprocity and early exams if you uh, need to use those functions. A small reminder with the uh, people who are already certified, you do not need a password to get into the portal. The only way to access the portal is through a six digit verification code sent to your email each time you access the portal, and that code will be different each time. If you have any questions, you can please call us at 602-771-0100, or you can also email the officer program itself. Um, if you get this password request screen, please don't put in a password. 
uh, putting it in too many times will lock your account. You won't be able to access it for at least 24 hours. Um, and then we might have to do some technical work on our end. All right. Once again, apologies for the technical difficulties. Looks like we're having a bit of issues on the technical side, presenting for David. So we'll go ahead and take this moment. Uh, go ahead, Karen. Well, I was going to say, if you um, show his presentation, I can get started on it so that we can. Perfect move it along and then as David is able to he'll jump in. All right. Just give me the go for when you want me to continue on to the next presentation or the next slide, excuse me. Okay, perfect. Um, so David's presentation today will be discussing UCMR5 that I've talked about briefly in the previous presentation and also PFAS sampling in Arizona. And um, David has, is our hydrologist in our drinking water value stream. He's been with the agency um, close to 25 years and has worked in multiple different value streams in groundwater, drinking water. Um, he's a great asset to our value stream and has provided uh, that experience and knowledge over the years. Next. So as I talked about as well, he's just kind of reiterating that PFAS stands for that broad group of uh, chemicals. It contains several different classes um, and definitely has different properties, including being hydrophobic and hydrophilic at the same time. So hydrophobic meaning that it is resistant to water and hydrophilic meaning that it's actually has an affinity for water. So it's a it's a very complex group of chemicals, they, it's fire resistant, it's used as um, insulating properties and things of that nature. For some of you old timers on the phone like myself, you may recall um, polychlorinated biphenyls, which you know had similar issues back in the day where the properties that made it so fantastic also made it um, environmentally uh, damaging, which is sort of the similar aspects to what we're seeing in PFAS as well. But obviously with um, PCBs, we're just dealing with, a, I think, currently a list of about six that are regulated, but PFO and PFAS, we're dealing with quite a few more. Hello? The four main, the four main PFO, the Hello? PFAS, count. go ahead. Oh, is, is my mic working now? Oh, fantastic. Yes, we can hear you, David. <laughs> Great. Sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties. So. <laughs> it's okay. All right. I don't know what happened. My mic was just spinning and spinning and uh, wouldn't turn on, but we're, we're he here now. So hello, everybody. Sorry about that. Thanks, Karen, for uh, pinch, hit, pinch hitting for me the last uh, second there. So Looks like we're in good shape. So yeah, like Karen said, I've been around for uh, for quite a while. Um, I graduated from ASU and then I went right into geophysics, um, which was kind of fun because we got to um, we got to blow stuff up and uh, track seismic waves, and we did uh, resistivity, which is basically tracking electrical waves in the subsurface and we, we were mapping um, mainly ore deposits but we did some uh, some water deposits and environmental work with uh, geophysics as well um, from there i went to um, holguin fahan and associates and worked in the ust program i did a lot of um were basically a huge sampling efforts for Chevron at the time, Unical, which I don't think exists anymore, and uh, Circle Ks. We were uh, sampling groundwater. We were pulling tanks, um, all that kind of thing, and uh, assessing uh, leaking, leaking storage tanks. From there, I moved to um, ADQ, where I worked in... Um, in solid waste, uh, did a lot of the hydro, hydro work for um, 
many with landfills, but also with ASTs. I also was training there, doing sampling programs at the time we were monitoring methane at landfills and collecting groundwater samples at, at the landfills. Like I said, doing ASTs. And from there, I went to ADQ's um, UST program, where I continued to work in USTs more from the uh, you know, the site characterization phase and the corrective action phase of, of the UST program. Didn't get out in the field as much at that point. From there, I went back and got my MBA and then uh, moved into wastewater where I uh, managed the uh, engineering review program for wastewater. And at a certain point, moved over to drinking water where we st I started working in PFAS. Initially, uh, after UCMR3, we realized that there was a, you know, there were uh, PFAS issues in Arizona and we started uh, designing our PFAS, the first PFAS sampling program with the EPA grant. As we were doing that, we suddenly got um, Switch to another program where we uh, decided to sample all the schools, in fact, every building in every public school in Arizona for lead. And we, we, we kind of talked about that. And at a certain point, they said, you guys are going to, I think it was December. And I worked with another person, you guys may know him, Vic Schur, who worked with me for a long time. And he had gone on vacation, he usually did in December, and they said, we want you to start uh, pulling, um, pulling lead, sample, lead samples from schools in a month. So we had a month to design the program and, uh, and start sampling. So we did that, but then in 2018, we got back to PFAS, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about, those, um, about what we did um, with that. And uh, then, so we did the 2018, we hired a contractor, we, um, we did the initial sampling program and uh, moved to the, um, then from there we went to the current round of sampling that we're doing now, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but been doing quite a bit of, um, of PFAS sampling over the last few years. So uh, please feel free to ask any questions. So that's a little bit about me. We can move on to the next slide, I think. Thank you, Karen touched on that. Um, so yeah, PFAS, this is just basically, you know, PFAS was initially thought of as a great product because it had so many uh, interesting properties, fire resistant, water resistant, oil resistant, and uh, turned out it was a great firefighting foam, probably the best for uh, fuel related fires. Um, and so now we're at the stage where we we're looking at um, PFO, PFOS, PFBS, and, and Gen X, which as you know, are as Karen mentioned, and I'll discuss a little bit more, are the uh, current um, PFAS chemicals that have a, a health advisory. Um, and obviously there, there's literally thousands of PFAS chemicals. So we go to the next slide. Yeah, they're they're used a lot in carpet clothing. Um, you know we've and we've sam we have luckily we don't we haven't done too much with carpet, but um, we've sampled around uh, paper um, paper packaging facilities. We've done a lot of around military bases at airfields. You know PFOS is everywhere. It's around metal plating facilities and metal plating. Turns out it's in a lot of um, other potential um, potential you know anything that deals with metal plating, gun manufacturers, electronics, you know even this you know so you, metal plating is kind of a can be very broadly defined. Um, as you know, 3M was one of the companies that initially started producing this material. Um, there, you know there's a lot of information out there. I won't get into that, but yeah, that kind of started, you know, 
you know, the amount of PFAS that, you know, 3M did put out there kind of started raising red flags about the, some of the issues with PFAS. Um, luckily, between uh, 2000 and 2002, um, PFAS was voluntarily phased out of, of uh, products. It, that's not to say it has been completely phased out. And, you know, there, there are still legacy stockpiles of PFAS out there, especially with the firefighting foams. So, um, you know, but there is an actual ADQ program that's working on firefighting foam. So if you're interested, you know, you can call us or talk to us and we can provide maybe some more information on that. Um, and then again, in 2006, eight major companies agreed to voluntarily phase it out. Um, I do know that even some fast food companies are working on that, um, phasing it out of their um, packaging materials. So. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll see less and less, uh, you know, direct contact for humans. Can we have the next slide, please? Let's see. So, yeah, common products that it that it was found in, uh, plastic, polymers, yeah, oil, Scotch Guard, that's the big one that everyone knows, Teflon, uh, Gore-Tex, uh, the surfactants, that's the, the firefighting foam. Um, the metal plating, semiconductors and photography and film products. I guess now everyone's using um, using digital cameras, so hopefully you know that uh, will help with the photography issues. Yeah, you find it in pizza boxes, fast food wrappers, candy wrappers, obviously all that non stick cookware that we used to use, um, adhesives. You know, they, they even were saying Teflon tape. When I first started sampling uh, for PFAS, you know, they said Teflon tape could potentially, you know, impact our sample results. I, I have sampled many, at uh, many locations with Teflon tape. Uh, you know, we always do follow an SOP. I'll talk more about that where we run the, um, we run the, you know, the sample taps for, you know, for a while we run the wells, we run the sample taps. And um, so we, we try to flush the system. So we're actually, you know, getting water that's representative of the aquifer. And I should say that's what our, when we started sampling for PFAS, we were sampling uh, at the wellhead because we wanted to be able to run studies and find out where PFAS was in the environment. So, so where, you know, that's gonna that's changed now with with UCMR5. But just so you guys are aware that when I'm talking about the initial studies that we did, we sampled at the um, at the wellheads. And if and if we couldn't, we actually weren't sampling at that point. Um, I do want to just take a second to remind you, I didn't put it in my slide, but if you go to ADQ's webpage, it's quite good. The um, If you want information on ADQ's, uh, anything to do with PFAS, it's right at our homepage, which is just azdq.gov. And you know how at the top there, like, it'll, I don't know, it, if you just open it up, it'll. There's a bunch of banners that keep flipping through, but I think the fifth one in is ADQ's PFAS resources page, and um, so there's a lot of information there. Um, I think you'll find uh, Arizona Department of Health has a really good infographic that's just real hits the real basics. So that's a real a real good one to have. And then as Karen mentioned. I think we're very close to getting our new uh, PFAS toolkit um, out there. So that'll have a lot of new information. So look for that. And um, and there's, yeah, so, and then you'll find our original report from our 2018 uh, sam sampling there. And an SOP for uh, private sampling. And just so you know, that SOP, I have an SOP right now for um, 
537.1, so I can I can give people copies of that if they would like. And I also have a draft uh, SOP for sampling for um, five for te EPA test method 533. So that's not on the website, but if people have questions or would like to see those SOPs, um, you, um, the 533 should be finished. And anyone who wants uh, the 537.1 SOP, I can I can provide that if they if they email me. I think my email address is on here. So um, can we go to the, the next slide? Thank you. So this is just shows a little bit about the, um, the human exposure. Um, basically, this is in for blood levels. You know, the first, when they started to really realize this could be an issue was um, with the 3M workers or in 2000. Uh, luckily, you know, we'll see these levels are decreasing. So they did. If you look down, you'll see this is both for P for PFOS and uh, PFOA. But they sampled the U.S. populations. Um, let's see, when was it? 2005, 2006, and um, and then they just sampled them again in 2013, 2014. So we can. We're seeing that you know a lot of the work that we're doing with these compounds is uh, having a positive effect on um, on uh, the U.S. population and hopefully uh, health impacts because, as Karen mentioned, you know that these health advisories and and the um, in fact the MCLs when they come out are based on on a lot of studies on risk and um, they're. There's a lot of information out there on those studies if you really want to do a deep dive. Um, but they, yeah, they're, they've been quite well studied, and so there's good reason for um, where they're setting the health advisories. And we can talk a little bit more about that because, as you know, they're much lower than our detection levels um, in the in the test methods that we're currently using. Um, next slide, please. The health advisory limits. So yeah, the old one. So we before uh, this year, essentially, we were working with the um, the old health advisory, which was uh, 70 parts per trillion, which was a combined level for both PFO and PFOS. So when we were initially sampling, we had a lot of systems that we sampled that had DTECs, both of PFOA and PFOS. And then as we uh, initially, that's all we sampled for. And then we expanded to sample a full list under EPA uh, health met, or test method 537.1. So we were sampling and for PFO and PFOS and you know a lot of systems were under that uh, that health advisory, so, so at the time that was good news for them. But then, as I think Karen showed you a similar slide to this in May of uh, 2022, we um, we got the current health advisory, and um, those are obviously much lower. Um, the good news is we, you know, for Gen X, we haven't detected any in our, all the drinking water samples that we've collected. So, you know, I don't I don't know why that is. I guess Arizona just didn't use it for whatever reason, or we haven't seen uh, Gen X chemicals in the environment. It is one of, it was kind of one of the later uh, PFOS chemicals that were produced. So, so that could be a reason as well. That just that you know it was produced later, and hopefully people were following better best management practices for the handling of um, of PFOS by the time Gen X came onto the scene. I also think that it's used more in like electronics and that kind of thing. So anyway, we haven't seen any Gen X, and we do see a lot of PFBS, uh, but. Luckily, uh, there again, we haven't seen 
any levels that are at the at the 2000 PPT level you I think you know maybe we've seen 100 200 that kind of range mostly mostly though what we're seeing for PFBS are levels that are you know less than 100 so so that's good news I will say you know and, you know if you've done any work with lab reports you've got the the minimum reporting level, when I get my lab data, you know, obviously the water quality, even with drinking water, does impact the detection level that the lab's going to be able to give you. You know, we're usually seeing, you know, if, if we're getting, they'll, usually the detection levels we're getting are about one part per Per trillion, obviously that's still way higher than um, what we're seeing, what the new health advisories are for PFO and PFOS. So right now, if you have a detect of either of those, um, essentially you're above the health the health advisory level. So you know that's kind of where we're at right now. Obviously, I told you that with the old health advisory, if you were above 70 for PFO and PFOS you were okay. So when the new health advisories came out, we had to call a whole lot of systems that were above the, um, the health advisory, the old health advisory, and say, oh, now you're, um, you know, you're below the health advisory level. So um, that was, uh, you know, an uncomfortable conversation that we did have to have with those systems just so that they knew where they stood. And, um, we're kind of waiting now. Where's that new um, MC? What's that new MCL gonna be? Um, I think they will. I think when they do create the MCL, they will look at the drinking water test methods. I think that's part of how that works to make that assumption is to, you know, they'll look at the data, the risk assessment, but also what can you reasonably test for. So. Um, we don't think that we think the MCL will be uh, more in line with what the um, the drinking water test methods can do. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, history of um, you of basically PFAS in Arizona. Yes, it really started with UCMR three. Um, they went out there, you know, the, the systems collected the samples, but we did detect a PFOS at, at six systems. And, and I think once we got that, that's when we started the, um, our, our, for, we got an EPA grant, as I said, I think we got about, um, $120,000 to do the first round of sampling. Uh, we did the, um, we hired a contractor. We went GPS to all the wells. Um, you know, worked with the water systems to get the contractor to go out there. I think that time we used, a, you know, there's a Eurofins is confusing because they they're buying up labs all the time. But we use Eurofins Eaton Analytical. They're the guys who uh, run the MAP program now. Um, hired, we, they did all the sampling for us. And um, and there is a report that uh, you can find on our webpage that that shows the results of that sampling event of those sampling events I should say um, keep in mind that report does still reference the old health advisory so new health advisory um, this what I'm telling you now kind of does is the new health advisory and like I mentioned the only thing we sampled for in that in 2018 was PFO and PFOS so then in June of 2020 we continued sampling we actually started out by going back out to every system that we knew had a PFO and PFOS in it from previous sampling events and resampled them but this time we sampled with the uh, with 537.1, so we ran the the full list at that time, and that's what we've been doing up up until present. So that obviously has given us a lot more a lot more data. 
and um, and so we that's why we were able to you know notify systems about you know the PFBS and other issues. So we continued that um, this year. You know, uh, unfortunately, we kind of, we started right when COVID was taking off, so that presented some challenges. But um, you know, we're we're kind of back up to to where you know we're doing a lot of sampling. And um, this year, we contracted with RCAC, and that really helped accelerate our PFAS sampling program. They were able to sample quite a few wells, especially. In the areas where they're located, which is Maricopa County, um, they did some Pinnell. They, we got Pima sampling done, and then in the Yuma area, they have a con, they have a um, a person out there who is doing sampling for us. So, so that really helped us. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, we've sampled today uh, 236 public water water systems. That's actually probably out of date by now. I'm sure we've we've done a few more. Uh, 57 of those are currently above the health advisory. Um, as I said, we called all those systems once the new health advisories came out. And then we, you know, we do get some with even with the new health advisories. There are some systems that just get DTECs of um, of PFAS constituents that um, aren't are below, either below the health advisory or they, um, which is PFBS. We see a lot of that, or they just get DTECs of um, of PFAS chemicals that don't yet have a health advisory. So um, that's why we have the 14 that are still below. As I said, no, we haven't found any Gen X. So, so, so that's the good news for us. Next slide, please. So getting ready for uh, for UCMR5. Um, so it's going to start uh, January of 2023. Um, that's going to be for all public water systems serving more than 3,300 people and some select smaller systems. Um, you should have been notified. Um, we do have a list, so if you think you should have been notified and you weren't, um, you can, you know, certainly contact me and I can uh, check the list and at least tell you where you're on it or not. If you really should be on it, we'll probably have to continue that conversation with the EPA. Um, so this time samples will be collected at the EPDS. Um, and also, you know, that there are some exceptions if you're if you're connected to another system there are some some rules for that um, so then there's this and then I've got this chart below um, you'll see that I just pulled this graphic or the, this information right from um, the EPA fifth unregulated contaminant monitoring rule fact sheet um, so surface water and uh, groundwater under direct influence or surface waters or mixed sources, the time frame is one year. The system is monitored four times during a consecutive 12-month 12, 12 monitoring period. So the sampling events will be, will be three months apart. For groundwater systems, which is honestly most systems in Arizona, although some of the big ones under UCMR will definitely um, uh, fall under the surface water requirement. The groundwater systems, they will be doing um, monitoring two times during the consecutive 12-month period, and then the sampling events must be three to seven months apart. Um, you know, we have always collected, when we collect samples currently, I, I take a sample, I take a dupe, a duplicate sample, and I take a field reagent blank. Um, you don't have to take duplicates under UCMR5, and that makes a lot of sense because um, basically you're going to be, 
and I'll go into this a little bit more, but you're going to be collecting uh, samples um, under 537.1, test method 537.1, and test method um, 533. Those samples um, will, you're going to analyze both of them. There is a lot of overlap under those two test methods. So that's essentially going to act as your QAQC. You know, obviously, you know, some red flags will go up if, um, if we're seeing di differences. So, you know, I think that's why they have, you know, they don't require duplicates under UCMR5. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, getting ready for UCMR5, uh, public water systems are required to establish, um, essentially you've got to go onto the, this CDX uh, S, SDWARS account and take the following actions. That's the EPA database where you're going to, um, you're going to input your, um, your results, you're required to go in there. And, and set up your account. You know, you've got to look at your EPDSs, um, make sure that you're, you're in there and that all the information is correct. There's, there's some good information on EPA's website. If you need to, or the bet, there's a, if you just Google EPA UCMR5, I think it's one of the first links that come up, if not the first link, gets you to UCMR5. There is one of the um, one of the buttons. Once you get to that page, there's a reporting requirements section. Go there. There's some videos for small and large systems that are interested in that. There's basically basically gives you all the requirements, the dates, um, links to SDWAR's website, um, and then an information of all the data elements that you'll need for that. So there's actually 27 data elements that you'll need to look at. So you know, th this is it's a really great resource. I recommend it to anyone. I actually pulled some of the information on this presentation directly from there, but obviously there's a lot more um, if you go to their, their website. Um, you should have gotten a letter if you're in UCMR5 notifying you about the um, about you about that you're in the program. Um, just so you know, especially for the smaller the smaller systems. There are some alternate systems, so just just be aware aware of that. Um, let's see, review and if you need to if you need to review, you know if you if you've already got information in their database, just review it, make sure it's up to date. You know maybe you've um, a, you know there's changes to your entry points, that kind of thing. Just make sure everything's current. Um, Make sure you've got your zip codes in there for your customers. Uh, review the sampling schedule and then uh, provide the uh, shipping address because EPA will, in some cases, for those systems, 10,000 or less, will be, uh, will be sh in some cases, shipping sampling kits. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So. By um, December 31st of this year, you may need a ground, if you want to do a groundwater representative monitoring plan, that will allow you to reduce the number of samples that you're collecting. Um, if you're, so if you're going to be sampling next year, you'll need to have your uh, groundwater representative monitoring plan done by um, December 31st of, of this year. Uh, so groundwater representative monitoring plans are complex. If you, if you decide now in October 
you want to start doing those, you'll have uh, your work cut out for you for sure at this point in terms of getting them done. Um, so you're going to be, uh, even though the sampling points are at the distribution set for the uh, entry point to the distribution system, when you're doing groundwater monitoring plans, you're actually looking at your at your wells. Um, you can use if you have old groundwater uh, groundwater representative monitoring plans, you can use those. So so that's a good thing. But if you need if you need a new one or you need to update yours, I mean that could, that's obviously going to be more work, especially if you've got uh, new sources that are going to be tied to the entry point and uh, yeah, there, there will be one plan for each uh, for each EPDS which could have multiple wells and other um, other uh, water uh, service connections uh, I mean sorry just water source connections not service uh, next uh, slide please See, so yeah, a groundwater representative monitoring plan is a plan that allows a water system to sample a subset of wells um, that should be required to sample this UCMR4, that's UCMR5 now. Um, if, uh, if wells can be shown to be representative of each other, it's based on hydrological data. Um, are all the wells in the same aquifer? Uh, well location and construction, you know, it's going to be based on, you know, the depth of the wells, where they're set in the aquifer, are they set in different aquifers, and then water quality parameters. Um, and, yeah, they must represent that the wells all draw from the same aquifer. So, you know, that's important. If they don't, you know that's gonna that's a that's a challenge for sure. So yeah, gotta 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 draw from the same aquifer. Okay, next next slide. Um, so you've got to have you know the maps are important. You know we had some issues. You know we really do need need good maps. Uh, the last time I reviewed groundwater representative monitoring plans. You know, they've got to be to scale. We've got to see location, distance, also potential sources. You've got to list those. Um, you know, obviously, we like, you're looking at a lot of sources. I've got, I'll, I'll show you that slide. I think that slide's on here. We've got to see the well information. It's always a good idea to send the ADWR well records, you know, hydrological map. That's going to be, very important as well. Uh, next slide. So these are some of the water quality parameters um, that we're looking at. pH, total dissolved solid, hardness, conductivity. Um, don't we found out the hard way? Don't use nitrates. You know that actually makes sense thinking about it um, because you know. Nitrates are not necessarily representative of the as a water quality parameter. There's a lot, as we know, human uh, potentially man-made sources of nitrates from fertilizer to um, wastewater treatment and that kind of thing. Um, so you have to look at the parameters, and and you can't just list them. You actually have to do um, statistical analysis on the on the parameters to show that you know you're looking at similar uh, types of water it's the uh, the one that most people use is called the modified Thompson tau method um, so that's something to to think about basically yeah you, you want to use that to show you know, I was, I'm, I'm not a statistician, although I should be because I took statistics a bunch of times. Um, but, um, yeah, something to think about. You can't just basically just show us your water quality parameters. you got to show that um, the data you're providing is statistically significant. Uh, next slide, please. 
So, and then you've got to look at susceptibility to contamination. Obviously, you know, USTs are a big one, you know, wharf sites, you know, industry, uh, landfills, wastewater discharges, um, agricultural irrigation, septic tanks, all these are important. And then, um, you know, as the UCMR5 is primarily about um, primarily about PFAS, you're going to want to think about, um, you know, your PFAS potential sources if you're submitting a new one, um, you know, uh, you know where we see a lot of PFAS is going to be uh, associated with uh, the military um, air force bases. You know, big, you know, Davis Mothin, Luke, but you know, we we also so you know, firefighting training facilities, landfills, wastewater. So that's something that we'd be looking at, especially with the round of a groundwater representative monitoring plans that people would be submitting currently for UCMR5. So that's just something else to think about. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So what are we sampling for under UCMR5? Well, here's the list. Again, I just pulled this right out of EPA's uh, fact sheet. Um, so you can find that online. If you need a copy of this fact sheet, you can email me or call me, and, I'll, and I will uh, email you a copy of it. But it's a good thing to have. This basically shows um, what you're going to be sampling for and what EPA Basically, these are the chemicals that they're looking for under UCMR5. So, as you can see, there's 25 chemicals there that are going to be um, they're looking for under 533. There's the four additional short uh, chain chemicals that uh, we're going to see under 537.1, and then. The other uh, chemical they're looking for is lithium. So I'm not really discussing lithium today, but you know, just be aware if you're doing your UCMR5 sampling, don't forget about lithium. I would say collect your samples for PFOS first and then collect lithium after you're completely finished. Uh, just as a way to, um, for you know, as I'll get into, there's a lot of things we have to do to um, ensure that we don't cross contaminate. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to speed up because it looks like I'm starting to run out of time. But I think Karen covered this. Unfortunately, the large systems have to pay for their own sampling costs. Um, EPA will arrange for analysis of, of the smaller systems. And then we're going, ADQ is going to try to sample everybody else. Um, we will do that at no cost to the water systems. Um, we will be uh, prioritizing certain systems, but our goal, and I hope we can accomplish it, is to sample um, all the other water systems that are not covered under um, under UCMR5. Uh, next slide. So for UCMR5, you do have to use um, a list of e uh, a list. You have to use an EPA-approved laboratory. Um, there is the uh, list here. The, that's the website I mentioned previously. You can get to this list of approved laboratories from the from from EPA's website. Um, definitely, if you're using one, some of the labs do not do all of the all the test methods. So just be aware of that. Um, it may be. You know, if you want to just use one lab, you're going to want to find a lab that um, that can 
uh, set, run all the tests. Well, there may, there may be reasons you don't want to. Um, I know City of Phoenix is on that list. Um, and, you know, I know that they have indicated to me that they would potentially work with other UCMR5 systems. So, you know, that's another uh, resource to think about if you're, if you have to do the UCMR5 sampling. Um, don't, you know, they, they are definitely willing to, to work with other systems. So I don't know how that works I, as, as, you know, they're not really, uh, uh, the, you know, you think of Test America or Legends or Pace. Um, you know, I believe they're those you know, the labs we usually work with, but it's kind of cool that there's a city who's willing to, to help as well. So keep that in mind. Um, anyway, you can search through there. There are a lot of Arizona lab, labs that we can use in Arizona that are on, on the list for sure. So, so check that out. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, let's see, what are we doing? We're going to try to sample all, the, I mentioned that, all the, all the systems not covered under um, UCMR5. Yeah, we will be reviewing all the UCMR5 data. That's part of, of UCMR5. Um, let's see, if you, yeah, we're not going to sample if you, you, if you are under UCMR5. So, um, and then, yeah, we review the groundwater representative monitoring plans, and the EPA does too. So that's something to think about if you want to submit them, that there is that dual review process. We, we review them first, and then we will send them all. We'll send those on to EPA if we approve them, and then they will also review them. Next slide. So what are the differences between 537.1 and 533 um, hold times? Um, you know, they're longer for 533. We always had to struggle with 537.1 because of that 14-day hold time. Um, preservatives, they have different preservatives. So this is a real issue with your field blanks because they're going to send you a preservative specific field blank for both samples. You're running 537.1 and 533. You're going to have to be really careful that you're using the correct preservative and that you're labeling very carefully um, so you don't mix those up or, or you know, there could potentially be problems with your samples and problems at the lab. So, um, so keep that in mind. That's going to be a major uh, component of, uh, of sampling under you know, both those test methods at essentially the same time. Um, I said no duplicates. So uh, next, uh, next slide. Thank you. So cross-contamination, that's a big issue. We're dealing with parts per trillion. And it's basically one drop in a large pool. Although, you know, I've heard, um, you know, if, I don't know. I've heard some, uh, if you get really technical, you know, that I've heard some problems with that. But I think it's a pretty good analogy, basically, for us that it doesn't take much to um, to cross contaminate your PFAS samples when your when your detection levels are that low. So, um, next slide. So I'm going to get into sampling. Yeah. So wear uh, cotton clothing. Don't use uh, Gore-Tex, you know, Tyvek or, you know, your rainwear, your Gore-Tex, that kind of thing. Next slide. Um, yeah, use the aluminum or, or uh, masonite clipboard. Use uh, ballpoint pens. Don't use Sharpies. That's always been a big one, and don't use those gel pens uh, just because they're going to smear all over the place. Never tried to use a pencil for sampling, but um, could work. I just imagine that there could be issues with trying to get that pencil on the labels. Use only Ziploc brand storage bags or the uh, Ziploc bags that are provided by the laboratory. 
and wet ice only. No blue ice, no gel packs, that kind of thing. Um, next slide. Um, limit the use of shampoos and cosmetics, insect repellents. Um, you know, there have been uh, PFAS found in those items. Um, sunscreens, you know, they're use the all natural ones. There are some listed here. Next slide. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Don't bring fast food wrappers. Obviously, um, you know, just try to keep your. I just try to keep a clean vehicle. No garbage in there. If that works good. I don't. Obviously, don't bring fast food to the site with you. That usually pretty. Um, you know, good advice. The bottled water is okay. I always bring bottled water, especially in Arizona. You got to have it. So, so that's fine. Uh, next slide. Um, the sample collection, make sure your hands are thoroughly washed. Um, run the sample tap for uh, 15 minutes. I've heard that, you know, if, if you have high chlorination, just be aware that could um, impact the preservatives. I know they actually do dechlorination as part of the test methods, but if it's really high, it's going to impact the sample before it gets there. Um, treatment such as GAC, like GAC could impact your your results or ion exchange. So I, just be aware that um, that that could have an impact and that your GAC and ion exchange might not, you know, it might be masking something and, you know, could mask the PFAS that you're getting and your system is not optimal is not optimized for it unless it has been. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, use clean nitrile gloves with every sample. And, um, you know, you get your, you'll get your uh, lab, uh, your bottles from the lab. Um, they should be HDPE or polypropylene. And don't rinse or touch the inside of the bottles because they will have the preservatives in there. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, fill the containers. I um, mean, you don't have. You can have some head space, but don't overfill it. Um, gently agitate. Secure that cap. Make sure it's on there, uh, nice and tight. Um, collect the field mat, field blanks again. You're going to collect them specifically for them for both test methods. So just be aware of that. Next slide. Um, you're going to fill, so you're you're going to take your re your reagent blanks are already going to have the preservative in there. You're going to go to your uh, sample location and pour your field blank into an unpreserved container. So uh, just be aware. You're going to do. Um, yeah, you do have to collect a field blank at every sample location. So you're, you'll have eight bottles total. Um, when you're collecting for UCMR5, you'll have the two for 537.1, two field blanks for 537.1. You'll have two bottles with preservative for 533, and then you'll have your field blanks. Um, you really own, you're really only running your field blanks if you have a, have PFOS detects, and that's why I put on the chain of custody hold for my uh, field blanks, and I always do that for my dupes as well, even though for UCMR5 you won't be running them uh, because that could save you some money just because of the cost of the sampling. Next slide. If you don't put hold, some the lab may just run everything. So, you know, identify your sample location. Almost everyone has an EPDS one, so you know that's going to be very important on your chain of custody. Make sure you've got your PWS number. That's your um, that's how that's going to identify you, um, and you know that's also going to be required for the. Uh, EPA uh, sampling, so that you just want to make sure you have that information on there, and then your public water system name, and um, ensure the information on your CSCs matches your labels, or you'll probably be going out there and resampling again. 
They're usually really good at the labs, making sure all that's correct to double check for you. So you want to make sure that every, your documentation is in order when you uh, submit your samples. Next slide. Um, you have to again use the Ziploc brands. Um, we, I always try to get my samples to the lab as quickly as possible. You know, 48 hours for 537.1 for sure, because they've still got to, that whole time is essentially not the 14 days for 537.1. It's not just for you, it's for the lab as well. So they, they need time. My SOP is always get the samples to the lab within 48 hours. I mean, yeah, 48 hours. Uh, next slide, please. So these are just some checklists um, that I use in the field just to make sure that, you know, and, and our contractors use them. That I, they're in my SOPs. So um, that's just a good way to make sure you're following all the protocols. Um, next slide. Second half, that's just the second half of the previous checklist. Next slide. I got another example of the checklist. Uh, next slide. Let's see COC. Next slide, please. So these are just an example of the labels for the for uh, EPDS. Um, that the way I would write them. Um, so. Uh, you know, I, you're going to have those eight sample bottles. I like to have my labels ready to go when I'm out in the field, especially if it's hot and, you know, you've got the other things going on out there. And then the next slide, that's just an example of, of the COC. Um, I just uh, made this up. doesn't reflect anything that I've done. And then there's, and then, yeah, thanks. You can go on to the next slide. I know I'm out of time. And, um, that's just um, the the data where you submit the data, the cdx at epa.gov. The labs will also submit data, so just be aware of that. And the next slide. That's that's it. So I'm open for questions if we have time. Thank you so much, David. It looks like we're a little bit crunched on time right now but I will definitely take all the questions uh, that were presented and I can send them over to David directly for him to answer. Great, thank you. Thank you, David. And we did promise everyone a quick 10 minute break. Uh, we did go over from our plan 1050 to 11. So we'll go ahead and do this at this point to and then resume at 1110. And then we'll follow up with uh, Yasmina's presentation to close out this uh, event. And we'll see you all back in 10 minutes. Thank you.
All right, everyone, so that we can resume and be able to end on time, we're going to go ahead and start as Yasmina is uh, preparing her presentation for the slideshow. Yeah, can you please confirm if you can hear me? I can hear you. Okay, seeing... and how? Uh -huh. You're, I'm seeing your uh, base presentation. I'm not seeing the full mode. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me do that. Okay, Perfect. how about now? You're ready to go, Yasmina. Thank you. Okay, I can't. Okay, so my name is Yasmina Markovsky and I'm Associate Engineer at Drinking Water Section here at ADQ. I hold PhD in Environmental Engineering and PE in Chemical Engineering. And in today's presentation, I will talk about uh, parameters di dictating selection of treatment technology for PFAS removal. I will first go through some background information that I consider important for understanding PFAS treatment. Uh, this will be short overview of uh, PFAS emergence timeline, their classification, structure and properties, naming and fate and transport. Uh, focus of this presentation will be on treatment technologies where I will be talking about five groups of parameters that actually that usually dictate treatment selection. Um, I will make technologies comparison in terms of infrastructure footprint, media selection, uh, base streams, ONM and applications and implications. Uh, after this, I will walk you through search steps when looking for certified point of use units and finish with a short quiz that will help me and ADQ understand if some aspects of this presentation were not clear enough and what should be focused, what should we focus on in the future. So let's get started. Mm, first thing that I wanted to address here is uh, PFAS timeline. It is important to understand that PFAS issue did not just emerge, but is present for quite some time. So if you look at this table, you will see that uh, synthesis and development of PFAS products started in 30s and 40s. And their commercial application is going on from 50s, which is 70 years back from now. Uh, First health concerns appeared later in early 70s, and as a result of these concerns, from 2000, uh, manufacturers started working on PFAS alternative, which actually matched timeline of improvements of environmental detection methods. So most of us, however, heard for PFAS in 2016 when EPA published health advisories for two PFAS compounds. These first health advisories uh, specified concentration of concern to be 70 ppt. This number was a big, big shock because we were talking about concentrations that are three orders of magnitude lower than MCL for arsenic, for example, that is on PPB level. Uh, however, earlier this year, EPA additionally reduced uh, health advisory limits for PFAS compounds and extended list from two PFAS compounds to four. So these four compounds are shown in the table together with their health advisory limits. Moving to classification of PFAS compounds. Uh, I prepared this schematic to help me explain what we are dealing with in a PFAS group that have more than 6,000 6, compounds. So all four PFAS compounds designated by, by EPA with uh, health advisory limits are on the left side of this schematic and they belong to non-polymer group. There are 
two subgroups here. So first one with per compounds where we have P4A, PFOS, PFBS. And second one called replacements. And here we have uh, GenX that was initially developed to replace uh, P4A, but it ended up on the health advisory list, which tell us that making PFAS compounds to replace PFAS compounds was not very successful approach. So even though not all of 6,000 PFAS compounds present a direct health concern, uh, all of them can indirectly contribute to it. And this is going on through their transformations. Uh, this is what is shown with red arrows uh, as a connection of the left and right side of this schematic. So even though that our concern is on the left side of this schematic, uh, knowing right side is important and should not be disregarded. Uh, next thing that I want to talk about is structure of PFAS compounds and properties that are a result of structures. I do not intend here to go with chemistry details. However, it is important to understand basically your enemy in order to defeat him. In this case, a typical PFAS enemy has two parts in its structure. It has tail and head. Tail is can be either short or long carbon bone surrounded by fluorides and stru such structure repels almost everything, including water. On the other side, PFAS compounds have head that likes water and typical PFAS head dissociates at pH of natural water. And this is why we see PFAS as an ion which means that it has negative charge. So big question is, what do we do with these structures and properties? How we can use them? Well, there are two structural trends that I would like you to remember here. First one says that longer the tail, stronger the hydrophobicity and less mobility. And on the other side, stronger the head charge, it's easier to make bonds with media and remove that compound. So knowing these trends will help you predict treatment performance and narrow uh, your treatment uh, options. Uh, the structure uh, of these compounds is further connected with the name or with, the, with their name. So I said previously that we have more than 6,000 compounds and their structure and names can be very complex. Uh, here, however, I will focus on simple naming principle that is used for uh, perfluoroalkyl compounds. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, so in, in this group, we are dealing with uh, four letter names. So first letter, is P and it means per. The second letter is always F and it means fluoro. Uh, the, the third one uh, can be different and the third one represents a number of C atoms and it's important to know here that it, it, this number includes a C atom in the head of these compounds. So you will usually see either O, o or B here which O stands for octa and means that you have eight C atoms and B stands for buta, which is for four C atoms. So that's the third letter that can vary. Uh, fourth one is for functional group or head of these compounds. And you will usually see S or A, where S stands for sulfonate and A stands for carboxylate. Uh, so if you basically see PFOS uh, compound, you can read that as perfluorooctane sulfonate. And same principle works for PFOA and 
PFBS, but not for Gen X, which is more complex. So the very last background info that I will talk before starting with treatment is fate and transport of PFAS compounds. Uh, this graph is very complex, but it's showing some key physical and chemical properties that influence compound behavior, behavior in the environment. Uh, while most of traditional contaminants does not meet all required criteria and accumulate either in soil, water or air, uh, PFAS compounds are so structurally so perfect that they can move through all types of environment. So we know that PFAS contaminated sites are, are mostly concentrated around factories that use these compounds, uh, firefighters activity sites or other known spill sites. However, we have seen wells with high PFAS concentration that are not nearby any of known PFAS sites. And one of the potential pathways for uh, PFAS contamination uh, and PFAS reaching to such isolated locations might be uh, atmosphere distribution that, the, that happens when uh, PFAS binds to small air particles and move by the wind. So what does it mean? It actually means that and thinking about the uh, source of uh, PFAS contamination, have in mind that PFAS are forever chemicals. And they may not be, they may be there like from 40s, uh, from some event that no one can remember. Uh, but also do not forget that there are many ways that PFAS uh, can travel through the environment and, and reach some very, very isolated sites. Uh, so now that we summarized uh, these significant PFAS properties and behaviors, I will move towards possibilities to treat them. Uh, good news is that PFAS can be removed with existing treatment technologies. However, there are few bad ones as well. Uh, one of the problems is that we don't have MCL, uh, which means that we are trying to meet health advisory limits, which are very low and not achievable due to technology drawbacks, instrumentation limits, and of course, costs. Um, and another significant issue is that after the treatment, PFAS hazardous waste is accumulated and we have to deal with it, which opens new operation requirements and brings additional costs. But with these pros and cons in mind, let's focus on uh, differentiating effective from non-effective non and developing technologies. So, under effective technologies, uh, we have granular activated carbon, ion exchange, uh, and nanofiltration and reverse osmosis. Uh, the good thing about these technologies is that they can be used in conjunction and with different configurations uh, in order to provide more robust PFAS removal. On the other side, we have non-effective technologies and here we have a conventional surface water treatment uh, that has coagulation, flocculation, and sedimentation combo. Then uh, we also have granular media filtration. Of course, this excludes uh, uh, GAC, but all the other granular uh, media cannot remove PFAS. Uh, the third one is oxidation, then we have biofiltration and low pressure membranes. So that was about non-effective technologies, but we also have a third group that is called developing technologies, which means that they show promise for removing PFAS, but have not been uh, 
adequately demonstrated to remove PFAS from drinking water. So here we have uh, treatments with ozone, chemical oxidation and other destructive technologies. So to repeat, technologies including GAC, ion exchange, nanofiltration and ARO uh, have shown the great promise for PFAS removal. Uh, although they each come with challenges and important considerations. So let's see how we can compare them and really select what is the best for, for your application. <clears throat> Infrastructure footprint is first comparison criteria that they have here. And we can divide this uh, in five aspects. So I have here treatment unit size, pre-treatment, post-treatment, hydraulics and capacity. So thinking about the treatment unit size, uh, you can make a significant difference here. So with GAC, you will have to have larger and taller vessels than what you would have to have with ion exchange. On the other side, we have RO, that definitely has like a highest footprint and that's because uh, it requires multiple pre and post treatment uh, units as, as well as multiple membranes for redundancy. Uh, moving to pre-treatment uh, with GAC, it's, it's very simple because it's so robust, we usually need only sedimentation pre-filter here. However, ion exchange is uh, more sensitive and uh, in addition to sedimentation filter, it also requires uh, dechlorination and that's simply because uh, chlorine can, um, can destruct uh, ion exchange that is polymer by its nature. So we have to remove that chlorine before treating with ion exchange. And uh, third one here, RO, uh, so it requires sedimentation filter. Uh, water has to be dechlorinated for the same reason like for ion exchange. And in addition, uh, we, we have to soften this water. So looking here, I would say that uh, ARO definitely uh, has uh, highest footprint uh, according to this aspect as well. Uh, looking at post-treatment, uh, GAC usually does not require any ion exchange sometimes, but mostly not. However, RO uh, does require post-treatment and it's usually carbon block and remineralization. So uh, hydraulics for these three treatment technologies is, is very different. Uh, so, when working with GAC, we have to provide contact time of about 10 minutes in order to remove PFAS by this type of media. However, with ion exchange, uh, kinetic is much faster, so this can be done uh, with two to three minutes. And this is actually what is, uh, what is controlling this treatment uh, unit uh, size. So because we need much longer contact time with GAC, uh, that's why we have a lot larger and taller vessels when we are planning to install GAC. And uh, ion exchange compared to this, it's much more uh, compact, uh, smaller and have faster kinetic. I'm not comparing here ARO because it, it works in a very different way. So it, it would not be possible to talk about hydraulics here in, in this sense. Um, and then on the last thing that I have here, it's a capacity comparison, which really depends on water quality specifics. But literature is reporting that ion exchange can treat more water than GAC before being exhausted, uh, while membranes, uh, they typically last three years. So if you 
don't have large space available for the vessels based on, based on these five presented aspects, you will probably select ion exchange for your treatment. Media specifics are next comparison criteria. Um, first, um, I would like to stress that not all types of GAC and ion exchange media will remove PFAS. So you have to know uh, what to look for. So if you want to install GAC for PFAS, uh, you should know that uh, that GAC should be made either of coconut shell or it should be coal based. Uh, on the other side with ion exchange, uh, it has to be an ion exchange resin but here you have options such as strong base ion exchange or weak base ion exchange. Mm. Uh, with ARO, we don't have a specific uh, type of membranes that I could uh, recommend here. Maybe that will be something that is coming in the future, but uh, as of now, I, I really don't have any specific recommendation here. Mm. So second one uh, is that um, each type of media has specific selectivity towards specific contaminant and its properties. As a rule of thumb, longer the PFAS change and stronger the charge, it's easier to treat it. So if you have to deal with, to deal dominantly with short PFAS chains, you will probably skip GAC that is more selective towards long, long chains and go with ion exchange or RO that can uh, treat smaller molecules. Um, on the other side, uh, we usually don't have uh, media selective towards one compound and one media is removing many compounds, which may be good, but also bad for treatment design. So good side of this is called simultaneous removal, which means that if you have GAC installed and you are treating for uh, PFAS, but you also have organics that you would like to remove, GAC will remove both. Uh, ion exchange, um, in addition to uh, PFAS, will remove anion inorganics such as fluoride, arsenic, uh, and so on. There is there is a wide range of of n n ion inorganics that you would like to remove. Uh, with aro, uh, aro basically removes everything, so it will remove a bunch of other things from from your water. Uh, however, bad side of of this effect is called uh, interferences. So. If you don't uh, have problem with organics, but you still have some that don't have like a health concern, they will still uh, play competing and fouling uh, role and uh, they won't be good for PFAS removal. So they will basically compete for the same sites as, as PFAS when it comes to GAC and it may uh, foul the media and clog the pores. Uh, when considering ion exchange, all anions will compete for the same sites as, as uh, PFAS. Then you will have natural organic materials, TDS, silica, iron, manganese. They will all cause fouling in the media, while uh, free chlorine can cause degradation. And uh, on the end, we have RO that uh, its sensitivity is very similar to ion exchange, but I would just add here that uh, hardness is, is very important. And that's why uh, uh, to have RO working properly, you want to uh, remove hardness before coming to membranes. So that hardness is very important and you don't want to be there or at least to be significant when, when coming to ARO. 
Uh, next is comparison based on waste streams. Uh, first type of waste stream is uh, used media. So if you are working with GAC, you have very nice option to reactivate that media. Uh, however, be, be cautious here uh, because uh, they are significant losses and about 15% is what is expected to be lost in the capacity of reactivated media. However, that's something that is option and you cannot do that with ion exchange. So at the moment when the ion exchange is, uh, is saturated here, uh, ion exchange is incinerated, so it cannot be reactivated. Uh, that's also not option for ARO. Um, then, uh, if you want to dispose media, um, both GAC and ion exchange media cannot be disposed on the on the landfill landfill, and that's that's significant drawback with with uh, treating uh, PFAS. Um, Let's see here. Uh, water streams are also different here. So GAC and ion exchange will recover all water, but ARO will do maximum about 80%. So as a result, you will have wastewater streams from ARO. They are called concentrate, and it will be new issue how to manage that. Uh, Please note that this stream is minimum 20% of withdrawn water, and this quantity is usually becomes significant. Mm, things are easier, but more expensive if you use uh, cartridge-based technology, because cartridges can be disposed with the uh, household waste. Next one is uh, O&M comparison. So even though uh, backwashing is common O&M activity for granular media, uh, please note that this is recommended to be skipped sometimes when treating for PFAS. I believe that this may change in the future when more studies uh, and testing are done, because if PFAS is absorbed to the media, backwashing cannot take it out. But and, until then, backwashing should not be done by default and additional information should be obtained from the media manufacturer. Uh, other than back, backwashing, uh, O&M for pre and post treatment units when dealing with GAC and ion exchange um, is done a few times a year as it is done with when treating uh, for other other known contaminants. On the same lines, ONM for RO is uh, known to be more intensive, and that all stays the same when treating for PFAS. Hmm. Applications and implications comparison can be analyzed uh, through five aspects. So all three technologies are well known uh, and as such, they already established specific prevalence. So GAC as oldest and more most robust one is dominantly used for PFAS. Ion exchange is newer and more sensitive and not so extensively practiced as, as GAC. ARO is on the end of this trend line and it is less practice than both GAC and ion exchange, which does not mean that it is less effective. Uh, all three technologies found application at point of use and point of entry scale. It is interesting to mention here that a common point of use adsorption media is actually a mix of GAC and ion exchange. And these adsorption point of use units can treat up to one gallon per minute, and their lifetime is expressed in volume of treated water. 
RO point of use units are different and their production is lower and usually limited to 20 gallons a day. Uh, what else here? So all three technologies can be scaled to meet specific demand and work uh, as centralized treatment. Uh, corrosion impact is something that is uh, very significantly different with these three uh, technologies. Uh, so if you have GAC, uh, you likely don't, do not have to worry about the, the, the corrosion impact. So usually GAC does not have uh, any, any uh, significant impact, anything does not do anything uh, negative on, on corrosion. Uh, ion exchange uh, does change uh, chloride to sulfate ratio and it may have impact on corrosion, which, which should be addressed. Uh, and RO, it definitely requires corrosion assessment because uh, the result of RO treatment is uh, soft, low alkalinity water. So potential for corrosion is, is very high with RO. Uh, last but not least is uh, cost comparison. And I provided here some cost estimates for point of use and point of entry units, but centralized treatment can be roughly estimated based on the point of entry. Uh, when talking about treatment cost, it is important to differentiate uh, capital cost that happens one time uh, from ONM cost that is repeating. So if you focus on point of use, capital cost for point of use is usually lower than for centralized treatment. And for all three technologies, uh, uh, cost per point of use unit is about is up to, I would say, uh, $1,000. Cartridges replacement cost is something that is repeating and can be very, very demanding here. On the other side, with point of entry, capital cost is more significant and goes from three to four uh, thousand per unit for GAC and an exchange to about 15 to 20,000 uh, for RO. Mm. But instead of replacing cartridges uh, for GAC and ion exchange, you are dealing here with bulk media and you are playing at the higher scale. So eventually cost of treated water is decreasing. Mm. What else can I say here? Uh, knowing how much treatment cost any treatment cost is very important. And my only advice here is to do MAP before purchasing anything. And that MAP should include both capital and ONM costs. Uh, there are a few other information about the point of use that is useful to know. Uh, point of use is quick fix but it brings many trade-offs such as treating a single faucet, that centralized monitoring and that centralized ONMs. ADQ approves N N NCF as a certified point of use and NSF 53 is product standard that tests for PFAS removal. Uh, Please note here that uh, current NSF certification is for health advisory limits from 2016, which means that these units, uh, units are certified to treat water to less than 70 ppb of P4S and P4A mix. Uh, after, after MCL uh, for PFAS is established, we expect that uh, NSF will adjust their certification as well. Um, searching for um, NSF certified units for PFAS treatment is uh, simple and has only four steps. So first thing that you should do is go on the NSF uh, 
uh, website. So it is basically database that uh, you can access. Uh, at the moment when you're here, you can search by product standard and select uh, claim, which in this case will be PFOS reduction. Uh, continue your search by focusing on uh, service cycle and flow rate of each unit. Uh, and for all additional information and cost, please visit manufacturer's website. And this concludes a treatment overview that I prepared for today. And I would like to ask you to voluntarily participate in quick quiz. As I said at the beginning, this will not be used for your grading, but uh, to help me and ADQ understand if some aspects of these presentations, presentation were not clear enough and what we should focus on in the future. So um, I have first question here. There are three options. Uh, and Ebony, uh, what, what do you think? What would be the best way to do this? Just to to ask audience to put uh, answers in the chat or, or something else? Uh, we can go ahead and look into the chat. Uh, looks like Justine uh, has already answered all of the above. <laughs> OK. So. Okay, the first question that we have here is uh, where in the environment you can find PFAS? So there are three options and please uh, provide your answer in the chat. Uh, sometimes more than one can be correct. It's looking like the consensus is all the above. Okay. That's great because that is the answer. Let's go on the second one. Uh, the second one that I have here is what is the MCL for PFAS in Arizona? Is that 70 PPT, 70 PPB, or it's not established yet? Hmm. Looks like the consensus is number three. Great, okay, so we did good so far. Uh, the third question that I have here is, are health advisory limits for PFAS enforceable? Hmm. Looks like we have some no's and some yeses. Okay, so uh, the question is no. Uh, so MCL is enforceable and we don't have it yet, but with the um, health advisories, it is important to understand that uh, if you are dealing with something that has a higher concentration that, than the health advisory, that means that it has negative impact uh, on the health. So our recommendation is to treat for it, but it's not enforceable. Sorry, Yasmina. Uh, everyone answered correctly. It was no. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, question four here is what is the charge of four um, health advisory limits PFAS compounds uh, when found in water around neutral pH? So we have three options here. It can be either positive, negative, or neutral. One, three, one, two, a question on two, and another three. Okay, so the answer here is number two, which means uh, that these compounds, when in water, they have negative charge. And this is very good for us uh, because that allows our treatment technologies to, to work to remove PFAS because uh, when dealing with uh, compounds that don't have a charge, it becomes very, very challenging to remove uh, any of them. So we are very happy that uh, PFAS in the water around neutral pH have negative charge. Uh, question number five is what treatment technology can remove PFAS from water? 
So I listed six of them here, uh, but please select all that apply. Definitely a lot of one, twos, and five. Perfect. Yeah, that's the that's the correct answer. And I think this is my last question. It says, uh, "What NSF standard uh, tests for PFAS? Is that uh, number forty-two, number fifty-three, or number fifty-eight?" Which basically means when you access that database, uh, you have to do some kind of uh, search. So if you are searching for uh, units that treat for PFAS, what what standard you will search for? Yeah, it looks like number two is the majority here. Yep, and that's correct. And that was my last question for you. And now it's my turn to answer on yours. You can ask me now or send me email uh, on this email address that I have here. I do have a few questions for you, Yasmina, in the chat. Mm -hmm. okay. Regarding t uh, treatment technologies, effective or not effective, is there any information on EDR or electrodialysis reversal process effectiveness? So that's definitely not something that is listed as of now as best available technology for uh, water treatment. Uh, I, I did read about that technology and I would put that here in developing group, but we are really following uh, EPA guidance and uh, that's why we are focusing only on something that is has been tested so far and proved has has proved effectiveness. So it's definitely not in this effective technology group. Uh, I would put it in developing. So maybe with the with the future studies, it can definitely find its way to to effective one. Thank you, James, for that question. Uh, this next one comes from Trevor. Uh, why are the PFAS chemicals levels, uh, the PFAS chemical levels rapidly rising in Tucson groundwater? Mm, unfortunately, I don't have answer on that question, so I'm not in monitoring group. Yeah, so maybe we can we can ask David and, and Karen if they have more information about this. David, Karen, do either one of you want to chime in? Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Uh, uh, from Trevor, why are the PFAS chemical levels rapidly rising in Tucson groundwater? That's kind of a complicated question. I don't know if I would delineate it as rapidly rising. I know that they are in the process of a site investigation and are currently pumping and treating um, much of the plume to prevent it from moving towards active drinking water wells. Um, we do have some additional information on our PFAS resource page if they're interested in those particular projects. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. If you need to follow up with any other questions, please feel free to email uh, any other presenters today, and we'll try to help you out the best we can. We can. This comes from Mark. Uh, if anatonic exchange uh, resin for PFAS will also remove contaminants like arsenic, will arsenic ion exchange media also remove PFAS compounds? Uh, so. Calling something arsenic ion exchange media is uh, coming from vendors. So there are many types of ion exchange, and uh, I don't know what they mean when they call it arsenic removal ion exchange media. So uh, strong base ion exchange uh, is something that can remove both arsenic and PFAS. Uh, However, uh, using ion exchange for arsenic removal uh, 
uh, went very far because we are dealing with this contaminant for years, especially here in Arizona. So you can find ion exchange that uh, is modified with iron and it actually improves uh, arsenic removal. Um, I'm not sure if uh, he's asking about that resin here, but uh, it is important when, when uh, looking for a resin for uh, PFAS to understand that uh, PFAS in the water has negative charge. So that's why we are looking for ion exchange that is um, uh, N-ion uh, selective. So uh, it can be strong base or weak base, but it has to be able to remove uh, that negative part, N-ion anion part of the, of the compound. So, yeah, I, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Uh, Mark, you can also follow up with Yasmin if you have uh, further questions. Oh, for Roxanne, is there an issue with the uh, incineration, putting PFAS in the air? Can we incinerate PFAS or would that cause uh, further air quality issues? Uh, answer is yes on, on, on both of the questions. So we can incinerate them because they're organic compounds. So basically exposing them to high temperature, we are burning them. However, uh, we do have issues with uh, exhaust gas and very strong acid, HF acid can be found in, in those uh, exhausts and a bunch of other compounds. So incinerating uh, PFAS is uh, something that works, but it brings many operational issues and it's not something that uh, we would say oh this is a perfect solution how to get rid of PFAS so that's why um, like uh, new destructive technologies are, are developing so um, one of the trend is to try to destruct PFAS with the chemicals uh, but again uh, you know we are dealing with with strong chemical solvents and they also have specific requirements or doing electrochemical destruction so there are many ways and we definitely have to uh, find something better than incineration uh, only thank you yasmina uh, one more question from brian are you saying that GAC cannot go to a landfill if PFAS were found in the source water? Mm, so th this is coming, um, I, I don't want to give anything uh, like wrong answer here. So this would be appropriate question for someone that, that is dealing with the hazardous waste and all of these regulations together with, with MCL, everything is changing so fast. Uh, but um, if you have PFAS in your water and you are using GAC, PFAS will accumulate in that GAC. And as of now, we see that GAC with PFAS is hazardous waste. Uh, this probably depends on the concentration of, of PFAS in, in that GAC and that further links to water usage, uh, concentration of PFAS in that water, uh, how you use that GAC and so on. So there, there are many factors playing a uh, playing role here. Okay, thank you, Yasmina. Um, table for the oh the table uh in the presentation said that it couldn't go to the landfill so i guess that was someone following up with another question um but we're at time here um thank you so much yasmina karen david for your presentations today if i may today uh yasmina if i may take a Uh, how, here. What should I do? <laughs> it's okay, I got you. <laughs> okay. um, just a, as a reminder, um, here are all of the uh, presenters' emails in case you need to do any follow-up. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions or if you want to dig further into their presentations, 
Um, today's PDHs, uh, or today's presentation was worth three PDHs. You are able to download all of the presenter's presentations, including the agenda that you will need to upload to your operator certification portal. Um, that, like I said earlier, this is all located in the handout section, and we just want to thank you all for attending. This presentation is also recorded and will be uploaded to ADEQ's YouTube uh, channel within the next week. Thank you all for attending, and this concludes our PFAS session.